This message was delivered by Dr. Greg L. Bonson, scholar in residence at the Southern California Center for Christian Studies in Irvine, California. We're looking at our last subdivision of the outline having to do with presuppositional theory. And at the end of our discussion, I've wanted us to look at two theoretical problems with presuppositional apologetics, problems that people raise with the theory itself. I mean, granted, we're all going to go out and defend the faith and say things which um, you know, we're going to say one way or another, maybe, regarding our theory. But when we as presuppositionalists lay out this theory, its adequacy has been challenged as, first of all, proving too much. Uh, because it seems to prove that unbelievers don't know anything. And the way in which we rescue the theory from that is by saying the theory includes that unbelievers know God, that unbelievers are, in fact, secret believers. You know, uh, that's a nice little slogan to get in your notes. Unbelievers are secret believers. But it also creates its own difficulty in that it looks like a contradiction. How can the person who doesn't believe this actually believe this? And that's why I offered uh, to you my proposal for a resolution of the apparent paradox of self-deception. But there's a different theoretical problem that has been raised with respect to presuppositional theory that we should address in this course, too. And that's that it doesn't prove too much, but does not prove enough. I'm going to give you two versions of the does not prove enough criticism. Two versions. The first one, if I can boil down and maybe oversimplify, the first version argues that the transcendental argument requires supplementation and is not, therefore, as distinctive as presuppositionalists think. So the first version of the does not prove enough is that it requires supplementation. It can't stand alone. And if it requires supplementation, supplementation, then Van Til's notion and the, and the presuppositionalist notion that this is distinctive from the traditional approach to apologetics <clears throat> is really over-flattering. It really doesn't deserve to think of itself as that distinctive. And uh, I'm disappointed that this criticism has been raised by my former professor, John Frame, in a recent book he's written, Apologetics to the Glory of God. I'm disappointed because I'm always disappointed to disagree with my friend John Frame. He's really a wonderful person. He was a great professor, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, and I'm disappointed because I hate to see anybody who's on the faculty of Westminster Seminary end up criticizing Cornelius Van Til. That, that too is sad. But I'm disappointed above all because I think Mr. Frame is mistaken. <clears throat> that doesn't mean I don't have respect for him. If we really had time, and I, I'm running out of it quickly, I know, I was going to go into something of an overall assessment of this book in this class, just so you'd know its strengths and also a bit of its weakness. <clears throat> so don't think that I'm trying to just say this book should be thrown out, by no means. And uh, I would say that the strongest point of the book, in addition to the clarity of style that, that uh, Mr. Frame has, <clears throat> the strongest point of the book is that it is a solid affirmation of the rejection of neutrality in all of our thinking, including a rejection of neutrality in, in apologetical thinking. Uh, Mr. Frame does not buy the criticism of the anti-presuppositionalist that um, you've got to approach um, the argument of the unbeliever on a neutral foundation. Um, and, and the book just does a wonderful job of, uh, of really beating down that notion. <clears throat> but sadly, it also makes a mistake, I think, of criticizing the transcendental approach of uh, Dr. Van Til. It isn't as though Mr. Frame has no appreciation for it. In fact, he, uh, he does speak positively, and in a footnote says nice things about your own teacher and a debate I had using the Transcendental Method and so forth. So he's willing to say there's something to this, there's something valuable to it, but it's not as valuable as his adherents think. It's not what Van Til made it out to be. 
So I'm going to begin on page 71 of this book, Apologetics to the Glory of God, and just cover very briefly, hurriedly, what Mr. Frame says in terms of questions he has about the method. I'll give you a little hint ahead of time. My clarification of the presuppositional method that you've been exposed to yesterday and especially this morning, if you keep that in mind, as we're reading, you're going to say, oh, Mr. Frame has made that mistake too. I think I think you'll notice that that has taken place. <coughs> All right, he has a series of considerations, six, I guess, all together. <clears throat> and then he turns to the um, transcendental argument itself and has a criticism of it. One, he says, I question whether the transcendental argument can function without the help of subsidiary arguments of a more traditional kind. Although I agree with Van Til's premise that without God there is no meaning, I must grant that not everyone would immediately agree with that premise. How then is that premise to be proved? Is it that the meaning laden character of creation requires a sort of designer? But that's the traditional teleological argument. So the bell's going off. No, no, that's not the traditional argument, but it's like the traditional argument. <clears throat> Is it that the meaning structure of reality requires an efficient cause? That's the traditional cosmological argument. No, but it's like the traditional cosmological argument. Is it that meaning entails values, which in turn entail a valuer? That's the traditional values argument. No, but it is like that. Now, in my dialogical responses to him, what I'm reminding you of is that Van Til never rejected the traditional argument. There is something to the argument from value, the argument from design, the argument from cause. But the difference is the traditional arguments have been formulated to honor human autonomy. Van Til does not reason from causes in the natural world to, oh, by the way, one more cause which we call God. Van Til argues, if you don't have God, the concept of cause is not intelligible. You can't fit the concept of cause into the practice of your life and philosophy unless God is also, particularly the Christian God, is part of your worldview. And so I think um, when Mr. Frame says that the transcendental argument needs subsidiary arguments of a more traditional kind, he hasn't honored the distinction between traditional and transcendental arguments. Um, from our tape ministry, you can get um, two lectures that I gave at Westminster Seminary in response to this book. And my first lecture was going through, I think, ten, ten profound philosophical differences between the traditional approach and the presuppositional approach. So I have to differ with him on this first point. But, but, I would say that the transcendental argument does require subsidiary arguments. If you mean by subsidiary argument, illustrations of the general strategy. Okay, What's an illustration of the general strategy? Well, I argue with Gordon Stein that we couldn't have a debate without the laws of logic, but that the laws of logic don't fit into a non-Christian worldview. I didn't mean that that is the one and only thing we can say as Christians. That was just one illustration of my general argument, which is what? Without the God of Christianity, nothing in experience is intelligible. And so then I take as an illustration this specific logic in my debate with uh, Edward Tabish. This specific was science. Can you use toothpaste tube and expect that your past experience will guide you in the future. None of those arguments stand by themselves. They're all but illustrations of the general strategy or technique. So in that regard, I agree with Mr. Frame that the transcendental argument is something of a, a general strategy, but you've got to put flesh on those bones after all. You've got to talk about something specific with the unbeliever. Number two, he says, I do not agree that the traditional arguments necessarily conclude with something less than the biblical God. 
Well, I suppose we can't overgeneralize one way or another, but it is true in many, I would think close to most of the cases, that the God that is proven by the cosmological argument doesn't have a whole lot to do with the biblical God. And in the case of Aristotle, the God that is proven as an unmoved mover that has no contact with the world, in fact, couldn't be the biblical God. So I'm not sure why this point is being made and how important it really is. All he wants to say is, well, can't we prove bits and pieces of our worldview at a time? What's the answer? You know this, yes and no. We can talk about bits and pieces at a time, but we don't prove bits and pieces at a time as though we first prove causality, then we prove logic, then we prove personality, block by block by block. But that's what the traditional arguments attempted to do. So in that sense, the traditional arguments don't really work within the framework of the total <coughs> Christian worldview. Three, he says it should be remembered the traditional arguments that the traditional arguments often work. They work because whether the apologist recognizes this or not, they presuppose a Christian worldview. For example, the causal argument assumes that everything in creation has a cause. <coughs> that premise is true according to the Christian worldview. But then he adds, and this is the kicker, but it is not true in a worldview like that of Hume or Kant. Precisely. But the traditional arguments do what? They assume that you can understand cause within Hume or Kant's worldview and from that move to the Christian worldview. And so what can he mean when he says they often work? The explanation sounds pretty good. To the degree that they work, it's because they already presuppose a Christian worldview. The difficulty, though, is that as traditionally formulated, they did not. In fact, they openly denied presupposing the Christian worldview. It was like, we can all agree commonly about there being cause. Now, what do we know as a result of that? <clears throat> I still want to affirm that part of what Mr. Frame said here, though, that to the degree that people argue at all, they're presupposing the Christian worldview. Number four, he talks about Van Til's slogan, Christian theism is a unit, and he says that he, um, he, he wants to make some qualifications. I do not think that the whole of Christian theism can be established by a single argument. He says you can only talk about elements of the Christian system at a time, but he grants those elements have to be understood as part of the total organism. Well, isn't he just saying in his own way what I've already taught you? Of course, we can only talk about certain things at once. But the way you talk about them, if we're going to be true to Christianity, is to talk about them in the context of the Christian worldview. So again, over and over again, these criticisms of Van Til are really not, I think, landing any punches. It's like taken in one way, they're not true or taken in a way in which they are true, they're not different from what Van Til has taught anyway. And then he adds, this is number five for him, if we grant Van Til's point that a complete theistic argument should prove the whole biblical doctrine of God, then we must prove more than that God is the author of meaning and rationality. He says, ironically, at this point, Van Til is not sufficiently holistic. For besides proving that God is the author of meaning, we must, or may in some cases, prove that God is personal, sovereign, transcendent, eminent, trinitarian, not to mention infinite, eternal, wise, just, loving, omnipotent, omnip omnipresent, etc. Thus, for another reason, the transcendental argument requires supplementation by other arguments. This is the weakest and the saddest of all of the salvos, I think because Van Til is not attempting to make one element of his argument prove the whole system. And why isn't he? Because he, he openly rejects the blockhouse method. He doesn't think, I've got one block, and now I'm going to go prove another block, and another block, and finally I'm going to build this house. What's his method? I've said, it's to stand within this worldview, this whole worldview. 
He's not standing within a worldview where God is the author of meaning. He's standing in a worldview where the transcendent, sovereign, infinite, eternal God is the author of meaning and comparing it to this worldview over here. And so by thinking that the transcendental argument, since we only talk about element after element after element or piece by piece, since we only do that, it's assumed that the transcendental argument is trying to build up by separate arguments, the Christian worldview, and then he says, very truly, no one argument can prove everything. Well, that's right. But no one argument is intended to prove everything because we're not proving point by point by point. We're taking this worldview and saying, now watch what happens when you deny this worldview. Here's an element that's lost. Here's an element that's lost. Here's an element that's lost. And so I, I think this really is misconstrued, Van Til. Number six, all this suggests a further reason why there is no single argument that will prove the entire biblical doctrine of God. To generalize, any argument can be questioned by someone who is not disposed to accept the conclusion. Such questions may require further arguments to defend the original arguments and so forth. Since there is no single argument guaranteed to persuade every rational person, there is no argument that is immune to such additional questioning. He says, therefore, Van Til's transcendental argument is not sufficient by itself to prove the existence of the biblical God to everyone's satisfaction. Well, this is disheartening because apologetics has nothing to do, has nothing to do with persuasion. I mean, we're interested in persuasion, so maybe I'm overstating it. My point is apologetical arguments not gauged by what persuades. It's gauged by what proves. You can have an argument that proves something and person refuses to be persuaded. So if I give the transcendental argument to somebody and they're not persuaded, yeah, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to try to hit them over from this angle, right? And then I'm going to run over to this angle. Does that mean my arguments are not in themselves good arguments? They don't prove my point? No, it just means that in, in the interest of persuasion, dealing with this subjective character out here, I'm going to try to say a lot of different things to them. But all of the arguments may be good as far as arguments go on their merits. And so he concludes that there's um, not a distinctively transcendental argument which rules out all other kinds of arguments. Where have we ever argued that the transcendental argument rules out every other kind of argument? Our only point has been that all other kinds of arguments have to be pursued, what? Within the general framework of the transcendental argument. So if somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, here's my big problem with becoming a Christian. The text of the Bible shows a lot of variant readings. That's what will explain to me what that problem is. And after they do so, then I go to the evidence of textual history for the Bible. And I show that to the person. And they're satisfied. Now, I've used a different kind of argument. I haven't said, unless you accept this, you can't understand anything. I've been willing to go with the argument as far as the person had asked. And if at that point the person's satisfied, great. But what if they started getting kind of ouchy about things and said, yeah, but what about this, what about that? Then I might eventually, you know, go to that fourth level that was up there on the board and say, I can come in up to hit you with a little bit harder stuff. You, you don't apparently understand that in our assessment of the textual history, we were already presupposing the Christian worldview to do that assessment. And so it's not as though it's a different kind of argument, it's just an extension of the broader argument. <clears throat> Frame says, the biblical God is more than this, but certainly not less. And we should certainly not say anything to an acquirer that suggests we can reason, predicate, assess probabilities apart from God. Well, that's the point I was just making. I may go to the evidence of textual history, but I don't want to go to it and say, by the way, we're doing this neutrally. We're doing this without God being the precondition of intelligibility. But for argument's sake, I'm willing to talk about that limited element and see if that satisfies the person. Branch says, must we bring up, must we bring this point up explicitly in every apologetic encounter, the transcendental point? Must we bring that up in every encounter? Must we always say God's the precondition of meaning? He says, I would say no. 
I wrote in my margin, I agree. We don't bring it up every time. We talk about a lot of different things. Maybe we talk about how things are going at home. Why is it the autonomy in your life is creating all these difficulties in your family? You know, maybe that's what I'm talking about. I don't always talk about the precondition of logic, the precondition of causality. And so, if, the, if Mr. Frank thinks that's what he's disagreeing with, that's sad because no presuppositionalist, at least any thoughtful one, believes that we have to always use the same argument with the same words over and over and over again. Let me read a paragraph in contrast to the things that I've just been saying about Frame's uh, critique of Van Til that I think is really great, okay, because I, I do appreciate him. Though he raises these questions and I think shows some misconceptions of what the transcendental argument with Van Til was all about, nevertheless he says, still modern apostles to intellectuals will find many occasions to stress the transcendental direction of apologetics. Autonomy has been routinely assumed in secular thought since the days of Greek philosophy and its Eastern counterparts. Intellectuals are often proud of their autonomy, sometimes called neutrality, unbiased objectivity, etc. And that pride must be abased. An intellectual will often agree to submit to Christ as Lord in every area except that of the mind. Sacrificium intellectus, sacrifice of the intellect, is a dreaded concept among modern thinkers. And he quotes, Oh yes, Jesus is Lord, but we must believe in evolution because all the best scholars do. End of quote. Jesus is Lord, but all the best Bible scholars deny biblical authority and inerrancy. End of quote. In reply, it is important for us to tell inquirers that Jesus demands all, not some, of our loyalty. And that includes loving him with the mind, which may well entail holding some unpopular views on scholarly matters. Praise God. That's exactly right. No neutrality. And he says, and for that reason, the transcendental direction of arguments is really good. I'm only sad that he thinks the transcendental argument is this narrow, abstract sort of thing that he says requires supplementation. What I'd say is it doesn't require supplementation. It simply recognizes that we need to give some illustrations of the general claim that we're making, that autonomy destroys you know, the intelligibility of human experience. Having said that, we need to go on and show how that's so in this case, in this case, in this case, and that. Okay, one more thing from Frame, and that's his assessment of the transcendental argument itself. Here he says the transcendental argument is really not all that distinct. He says, certainly arguments of this form are often useful, but I have a question about them. Are indirect arguments, remember how I described transcendental argumentation as indirect, compare total worldviews, argue from the impossibility of the contrary. He says, are indirect arguments really distinct from direct arguments? In the final analysis, it doesn't make much difference whether you say causality, therefore God, or without God, no causality, therefore God. Any indirect argument of this sort can be turned into a direct argument by some creative rephrasing. The indirect form, of course, has some rhetorical advantages, at least. And I think it's here that he, um, he makes note of my debate with Gordon Stein. And says Stein was just, I mean, he wasn't prepared for that way of doing it. So rhetorically, he had an advantage. But if the indirect form is sound, the direct form will be too, and vice versa. Indeed, if I say without God, no causality, the argument is incomplete unless I add the positive formulation, but there is causality. Therefore, God exists. A formulation identical with the direct argument. I already told you I appreciate John Frame a great deal. He taught me a great deal. But the day comes sometimes when you simply have to flat-footedly say, I'm sorry, Herr Professor, you're wrong. 
and this is not correct, to say that indirect transcendental argumentation is just a rhetorical reworking of direct argumentation. Um, when I was discussing this with some other philosophy students, graduate students who are studying under me, one reminded me of the remark of Wittgenstein that I used in my lecture when I was uh, there at Westminster. Wittgenstein once said, you know, for a mistake, this is too big. For a mistake, this is too big. We don't call some disagreements mistakes because in order for there to be a mistake, you've got to be within at least the right ballpark. And then being within the right ballpark, you can get things wrong and you say, well, you've made a mistake. That's like a foul ball. But you know, to say that in the baseball game, he kicked a field goal, that's not a mistake. It's like you've just totally got the games wrong. You with me? I mean, that's, that's a great little expression. For a mistake, this is too big. It can't be a mistake. It's too big to be a mistake. And I must say that what Mr. Frame has said here is it's just too big to be a mistake. It's just overwhelmingly wrong. A transcendental argument is not a version of direct argumentation. You can see this in case of the cosmological argument, perhaps, by my saying. The cosmolo cosmological argument says we have, the, we have this event over here that has a cause, but that cause had to be caused, this cause had to be caused by something further, until we finally get down to the end of the line it would appear, and then we say, and there must be one more cause, and that's the one we call God. So that God is put, if you will, on a horizontal level with all the other natural causes, it's just he's the biggest or the first of the natural causes. God becomes one more cause in the chain on that argument. But in the transcendental argument, God doesn't become one more cause in the chain of causes. He becomes the precondition of the intelligibility of thinking causally at all. Do you all see the difference? One, one kind of argument asks for what's the first of all the causes. The other kind of argument says what would have to be true for us to think about causes at all? And so transcendental arguments are not a version of direct arguments. You cannot just creatively rephrase things and get the cosmological argument out of this. Though, I've admitted this in our class already, there is some similarity between the cosmological argument and the transcendental because the cosmological argument captures, to our way of thinking, something unique, that causal principle. And we say, well, we've been caused by God. We know that in our heart of hearts. Still, for all of it, the arguments are not doing the same thing at all. And for a mistake, this is too big. John Frame's a good philosopher and a good reader and a good theologian. I argued, he was sitting in the audience, and so it's all with goodwill and love and charity and humility. But I argued that there must be something else going on here than just misconstruing what a transcendental argument is. What is it that makes us say things which are really outlandishly mistaken? Most students, by the way, would not have caught that. I mean, because they don't understand the history of philosophy. They may not specifically understand transcendental logic. And so he says that, and they trust him and go on. But anybody who studied Kant, anybody who knows the nature of transcendental argumentation, is not going to think that when Kant said we think causally because our mind imposes that on all of our experience. The Kant was saying causation is just one more, uh, what I have is one more clear and distinct idea. He wasn't being a rationalist. Nor was he saying, I have an observation, like the empiricist would say. Kant was not being a rationalist or an empiricist. He was doing something different altogether. He's saying, what has to be true for any of this to make sense? So again, People should know that my beloved professor has made a mistake here. How could he make a mistake like that? Well, in my estimation, I'm psychologizing now, and he's heard me say this publicly, so I'm not talking behind his back. I think that uh, Mr. Frame has such a, um, a godly and good desire, such a godly and good desire to bring unity within the Christian world to try to get these warring parties to lay down their weapons and to listen to each other and be teachable. That he has such a, uh, that's a good and godly thing. He, but he has such a desire for that that that's interfered with the, with the intellectual assessment of what's going on. 
better to knock off the edges and to, if you will, rub down the differences so that we might think like we can get closer together because that would serve the purpose of unity among Christian apologists. That's my guess. But anyway, it's a big mistake, and I, and I have to disagree with it. The transcendental argument is distinct from rational and empirical argumentation. It does not require supplementation. It simply requires illustrative expression. And so if you, that's all he's talking about is, well, you've got to apply it to causality. You've got to apply it to logic. You have to apply it to human meaning and language and so forth. That's fine. But I don't consider that supplementing it. I just consider that carrying it out. Okay, and then the second version of the it does not prove enough criticism of presuppositionalism says it does not show Christianity to be the only position which can provide the preconditions of intelligibility. Please turn the cassette over at this time. I'm in a hurry, I'm just saying does not provide the transcendental the preconditions of intelligibility. The argument is that when we present our transcendental case for the truth of Christianity, we are not showing Christianity to be the only position. This argument, uh, or this criticism, will grant that we are showing that Christianity is a precondition of intelligibility, or that it has preconditions of intelligibility. That is, the argument would grant, yes, if you have a Christian worldview, then you do have logic, you do have causality, you do have human personality, freedom, rationality, on and on and on. However, you have not shown in any of that that you're the only position that is able to do that. And so one of the questions that we got here in class reads, um, <clears throat> do we say atheism presupposes theism, or do we only show that each brand of unbelief considered on a case-by-case -case basis, one at a time, is untenable because it can't justify the use of reason, dot, 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 and then show that Christianity does not have these particular defects? Well, let's put it another way. How do you get from the claim that the Christian self-authorizing circle is objectively true and provable how do you get from that claim? Let's say that you've made good on that. To the claim that the Christian's worldview is the only objectively true and provable one, when we must negate various brands of unbelief with internal critiques on a, a one at a time, on a case by case basis. Okay, I think that's very well put. You should understand the criticism. We have a lot of different varieties of autonomous worldviews out there. And so, I talk to somebody and he has variety 39. I compare my worldview to his. I show that his has internal defects. He doesn't have the preconditions of intelligibility for human experience. He makes nonsense out of life and thinking and so forth. I show that my worldview does not. Now, the criticism is this. You haven't thereby shown that yours is the only one. You've just shown that yours works and his doesn't. But there's still... 22 more other versions out there. No, not 22. Can't do my math right on the spot. What's 57 minus 39? Whatever it is, <laughs> there's another one, and another one. And by the way, if you spent all your life refuting worldview after worldview after worldview, you still wouldn't be able to say there's not another one out there. So you all understand the criticism? I'm proud of you for thinking of that in this class because uh, I've known people who've done doctoral dissertation, well, I know one doctoral dissertation that was written, and that was the very point that was argued against that. Okay? But it, too, rests on a misconception, I think. At the beginning of our class period today, I said, you must remember that we can only talk about one point of view at a time. I can't talk to you about existentialism and empiricism you know, and uh, hylozoism and so forth, all at once. You just, you just can't say everything at once. So I got to deal with one person at a time or one point of view at a time. However, what I'm dealing with here is just an illustration of a broader perspective. 
we have only two perspectives, broadly speaking. The whole enchilada of the Christian worldview, remember me putting it that way? And then you've got the autonomous approach. Now, among the family of autonomous thinkers, there's a lot of variation. And some in the family like Chinese food. Some in the family like Mexican food. But the point is, they're all in the same family. The fact that I'm only dealing with one member of the family doesn't mean I haven't dealt with the problems of everybody in the family. Because the problems that I have with the Mexican food version of autonomy will prove to be the same problems from the Chinese food version. It's just that I'm not talking to the Chinese food version right now. The presuppositional argument is not an inductive survey. You must put that in your notes. If you don't understand it now, go home and think about this. I said about another criticism that we dealt with, that the transcendental approach is not a block-by-block -block approach. Prove logic. Okay, now prove causality. Now cause, uh, prove personality put all these blocks together and eventually you get the worldview. I said, no, we start with the worldview. It's ready-made. And we say, if you don't stand within this worldview, then here are some of the problems that you have. Here are some of the blocks in your worldview that get knocked out. So we're not saying, first prove this element, then prove that element. Likewise, presuppositionalism is not a case-by-case-by-case -case -case inductive survey. It's not like we're going out there and saying, okay, here's a version of theonomy. It didn't work. Now let's find another one. Oh, now this second one didn't work. Now let's find another one. This third one didn't work. And then eventually we stand back either because we've gotten tired or we think we've done enough work and we say, well, then all of them won't work. That is not the argument. If it were, it would be weak. Because any inductive survey that's incomplete, you don't know how much more is out there. But that isn't the argument. We don't consider this, I'll believe Christianity is the only option on a case-by-case -case basis. I begin by saying Christianity is the only option. Now, who wants to fight? Now, the existentialist steps up. And they say, well, boy, you got these problems. The evolutionist steps up. Got these problems. So I don't go back and say, okay, now I'm keeping score. I've got one worldview taken care of, two worldviews taken care of, three worldviews taken care of, I'll bet you I could beat anybody. It's not an inductive survey. What I'm saying is, this is the only conceivable option. Now, who wants to step up and talk about that? But what I say to the existentialist about his problems is going to be repeated, regardless of the illustrations they use, when I talk to the hylozoist or the evolutionist or anything else. It's just illustration after illustration of the same general claim. Let me put this to you another way, kind of clear the register. I said we compare entire worldviews, right? The entire enchilada of Christianity versus the entire worldview of the existentialist or the evolutionist or what have you. Now, is a worldview disproven if one of its essential claims is false? Well, you can't be that tired. This is an easy one. Let's see some nodding here. Yes, Dr. Monson, isn't that obvious? If I'm comparing two worldviews, we use our square and circle. Here are our two worldviews. And I can show that an essential element of this worldview is false, that in fact it's not coherent, is it? The worldview is not going to be adequate. You can't use a false position as the foundation for all that you think. Well, I mean, you can, but the point is it will not be intellectually successful to do so. <coughs> That's why when I debate with the atheist, and I point out your worldview can't salvage logic, but you need logic, what I'm saying is your worldview is not a precondition of intelligibility. You can't make sense out of life on your worldview. So if I show a false element in his worldview, that I've destroyed his worldview as the precondition of intelligibility. Everybody knows what I'm saying here? Now, if the Christian worldview claims to be the exclusively true precondition of intelligibility, 
that claim is either true or it's false, isn't it? Christianity says this is the only way. Well, if there's another way besides Christianity, then Christianity is wrong to say it's the only way. And if Christianity is wrong to say this is the only way, then you've got a faulted worldview. Can a faulted worldview be the precondition of intelligibility? No, it can't. Therefore, if Christianity is the precondition of intelligibility, it must be the only precondition of intelligibility. It must be the only worldview that will do that, because it says it's the only worldview. I hope you notice I am not coming before you and saying Christianity says it's the only one, so that's it. It has to be the only one. What I'm saying is, if Christianity is going to be accepted as a pre as providing the precondition of intelligibility, it can only do so if it's the only one. Because essential to this worldview, essential to this whole enchilada, is that it's the only enchilada. And that's why I don't have to worry after I've knocked down nine or ten opponents out there of worldviews that maybe the eleventh one's going to come along and get me. As a Christian, my certainty rests in the self-attesting authority of God. Given the self-attesting authority of God in this worldview, I can make sense out of human limitation as well as human rationality. The good in man and the bad in man. I can make sense out of particularity as well as universality on and on and on. So it does appear to provide the preconditions of intelligibility. But if it should be wrong in a major claim, an essential, a central claim that it's the only one, then it's not, in fact, a worldview that provides the preconditions of intelligibility. So that's why I say, if ours is, it must be the only. One more version of the does not show Christianity to be the only position. One of the ways in which we should be satisfied that it's the only one, I'm not resting in this, but one of the ways is we should say, well, where's, where's the alternative? Right? It's legitimate to take that approach. I say I'm the only guy who can do this. Where's my competitor? Let's have him come up. Now, after a while, people stop coming, you know? One steps in and goes, oh yeah, well I'm a rationalist, and then you refute him. Another guy comes up, I'm an empiricist, you refute him. After a while, people stop coming up. We say, where are they? Where are the opponents? Come on. What does Paul say? Where is the scribe? Where's the debater of the sage? Come on. Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Aren't you satisfied? Haven't we beat you up enough? Where's the next guy? No one steps forward. Now, it's legitimate in terms of our social interchange to say, this is the only one because it's the only one we can find. But then someone will say, but you don't know what might come up in the future. I love it when that criticism is made of presuppositionalism. I say, no, wait a minute. Let, let me see if I understand the scenario as you're presenting it to me. We have all these different worldviews out there. All these different options are out there. And the ones that are out there that we know about, when Christianity gets in a debate with it, boom, 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 they get all knocked down. And then somebody has been knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. All these vain hopes of having an alternative to Christianity have been slain. He doesn't have a clue as to what the next one would be. But he says, maybe, maybe in the future somebody will have one. Well, you see, that isn't what you call, we don't call that reasoning. We call that blind faith. Isn't that right? And the irony to me is that, and I've been in academic circles for many years, the irony to me is that's the way the unbelieving world thinks Christians operate. The unbelieving world thinks we're the ones who say, oh, we can't answer this, but maybe in the future. We just have this blind faith, the eschatological cop-out, as we put it. The day is coming when God will make it all clear, but we couldn't possibly answer you now. And lo and behold, now we have the unbeliever saying that, and we're supposed to say what? Well, we shouldn't have any confidence that we're right because maybe out there somewhere somebody will develop an alternative. That's just wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is not an argument. What's apologetics about? Argument. We can all get together and exchange wishful, hopeful, you know, ideas of what might happen someday, but that's not an argument. So if apologetics is about argumentation, 
if all the opponent of the presuppositional theory has is wishful thinking, I have nothing to worry about. And of course, that wishful thinking is totally inadequate for the present debate anyway. Because it's not in the future that my thinking becomes intelligible, it's in the present that my thinking is intelligible. How is it that my thinking is intelligible now, and the thinking of the entire human race going back all these thousands of years has been intelligible, but no one has ever had a clue as to how it could be intelligible? You see, this wishful thinking is worse than just a failure to argue. It's a failure to look at what we've been doing all along. It's just one more version of saying, the facts may point to God, but I am going to close my eyes and I don't want to think about it. So I don't think either one of these versions of it does not prove enough are really effective against the presuppositional theory. Nor do I think that it proves too much is effective. And the time has to come when I just say, okay, I quit. I've laid it out for you. I've done the best I can. I hope that this seems cogent to you and that you're satisfied. We got to stop dealing with theory and eventually get into the ring. Okay? Let's take a two minute break, clear our mental registers, and when we come back, then we're going to do some fighting. The whole discussion didn't get on tape. I think it would be helpful to others to hear that as well. But hey, that's like the next time with our Muslim apologetic seminar. <laughs> And he'll get one of her relatives to come. <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, if we start up again, we turn now to the practice of apologetics. I hope it's not true, hey, but maybe that. some of you would have been just as happy if we would have started right here on the first day of fall. <laughs> get rid of all this theory and all this other meta theory talk and so forth. Let's just get down to it and find out what do you say about this and what do you say about that. And our time is short this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to be able to present everything that I prepared and brought, but I would like to illustrate the practice of apologetics in at least three different kinds of settings. Uh, maybe I haven't chosen your favorite philosophical problem or scientific problem, but I'll at least give you an idea of how to deal with each of these areas. I'm going to look at a philosophical attack on Christianity, a scientific attack on Christianity, and a religious attack on Christianity to show how we give a reason for the hope that is in us, hopefully with gentleness and respect. The philosophical attack will come from uh, the modern uh, world of philosophy, 20th century, problem of religious language. That's fairly contemporary, though it's, it's, it's lost some of its zest by uh, this day and age, but over the last 30 years it's been a live issue. The scientific attack I've chosen is uh, the evolutionary approach that says you can't trust uh, what the Bible says about creation. And then the religious attack, I thought the one he's been most interested in is the attack of uh, Islam against Christianity. Because after all, they're supposed to be so close to us that maybe they can do everything we can do, right? And I'd like to demonstrate that that isn't at all acceptable. Okay, let's practice apologetics in the philosophical realm for setting it. The question or the attack will sometimes be broached against Christianity, the rhetorical question, is all this talk about God even meaningful? Is it even meaningful to talk about God? philosophical circles during much of the 20th century, two issues which have dominated discussions in philosophy of religion and thus two of the most popular polemics against the credibility of Christian commitment have centered on the meaningfulness of religious discourse. Religious discourse involves talk 
about God, about immortality, about miracles, about salvation, about prayer and values and ethics. To speak of the existence or attributes of God, for example, is to make religious utterances. All religions which are promulgated publicly must in some measure use religious discourse. And Christians, in particular, engage extensively in utterances concerning God and their faith. After all, Christianity is preeminently a religion of verbal revelation from God and personal profession of faith. And thus Christians are always talking religiously. They're talking religiously in sermons, in prayers, in confessions, in didactic lessons, in catechisms, in personal testimonies, in songs, in exclamations, in counsel, in encouragement, and on and on. The challenge made by many modern philosophers has been that talk of this kind is not really meaningful in any cognitive sense, even if it has the deceptive appearance of being so. For years and years and years it may have seemed that when Christians used language about God and salvation it was possible to make pretty good sense of what they were saying. Not everybody believed that what Christians would utter was true, but the God talk of believers was at least thought to make or entail assertions which carried rationally intelligible, if not spiritually intoxicating, meaning. But not so, according to modern philosophers. The view that's been adopted over the last 30 or 40 years is that religious utterances are worse than false. That worse than false. They make no sense at all. The magnitude of the charge which has been made against the intelligibility of Christianity must be appreciated by believers here. When philosophers claim that God talk is meaningless, they're saying something far stronger and far more devastating than that talk about God is false, is not true. Their criticism is that religious utterances don't even qualify to be false or true because they don't amount to talk that makes any cognitive sense. It doesn't amount to any talk that conveys information in the first place. You might think about it this way. It's one thing to criticize the Chicago Cubs for not winning the 1991 pennant. It's altogether another thing to charge that the Cubs were not even a baseball team to begin with. Okay? So it's one thing to say that religious utterances are not true, they're false. It's altogether another thing to say they're not even intelligible utterances. And thus religious language, many would charge, is simply meaningless. If I say it snowed in Dallas last summer, I've uttered a sentence which is meaningful but is false. It makes a cognitively meaningfully claim which happens to be an error. However, if I say some last Dallas snow, I haven't made an intelligible claim at all. That's simply meaningless on any ordinary reading and conveys nothing which could be true or false. And many critics of Christianity claim that its utterances similarly are not subject to being either true or false. They make no significant claims about the world or about the world of human experience anyway. And thus they are cognitively meaningless in one of the following ways. The utterance of an exclamation like, ouch, is neither true nor false, because it doesn't claim that anything is the case. It's merely expressive in its, in, in its linguistic function. And many people have maintained that religious language should be interpreted in the same way, as simply emotive talk rather than informative talk. Others have gone further. For them, Talk about God makes absolutely no practical difference to a person's observations of the physical world or a person's operations upon the physical world. That is, the claims made by religious believers and the counterclaims made by their opponents have no distinct conflicting cash value in the public domain. Believers and unbelievers just perceive and do the very same things, but they talk about it differently. Their respective interpretations or explanations of what they perceive and do are really meaningless. That is, a verbal difference that makes no practical difference, just empty talk. 
but others have gone further than that. Religious discourse is for them simply unintelligible, like superstitious gibberish, which cannot be rationally translated. When people talk about God, the afterlife, miracles, or salvation, they're engaging in a kind of linguistic ritual which is learned by imitation and passed along without any cognitive understanding. And that explains why the uninitiated, why unbelievers, cannot have religious utterances put in their own language, why they do not catch on, they do not feel intellectually compelled to affirm what believers say, and indeed care very little about it anyway. It's just meaningless babble. However, the meaningfulness of religious language has come under attack in philosophical circles in two particular ways in this century. And I want us to look at each one of them in this lecture. The first can be designated the verificationist challenge to religious discourse. So we're going to talk about the verificationist challenge. And the second is designated the falsificationist, falsificationist challenge. And I think neither has proven to be successful. Let's start with the verification challenge to Christian, the meaningfulness of Christian discourse. In the earlier part of the century, a school of thought known as logical positivism zealously promoted empirical science and disparaged any kind of metaphysics. According to the positivist, any proposition could be tested for meaningfulness by applying to it quote, the verification principle. Logical positivism acknowledged two different kinds of meaningful sentences. Certain sentences in a language will be known to be true simply by means of analyzing them logically and linguistically. For instance, all bachelors are unmarried. That can be verified by reference to the laws of logic and semantic definitions. However, such truths as these, called analytic truths, are devoid of significant information about the world of experience or observation, and thus are always trivial. For, uh, for a sentence to tell us something interesting, or to have a factual component to it, its truth must be verifiable by looking beyond logic and meaning to one's observations or experiences of the world. Thus, a significant or non-trivial sentence is meaningful, according to the verificationist, only if it can be empirically confirmed. Its truth or falsity would make a difference in our experience of the world. Meaningful sentences should be translatable either into observation terms alone, that is, descriptions of the immediate experience, or into a procedure used to confirm the sentence observationally. The effect of applying the verification principle, the positivist concluded, would be the dismissal of all metaphysical claims, including theology, and all ethical claims, both of them being dismissed as nonsense from a scientific standpoint. Since the religious language of Christians is filled with terms which are not taken from observation, references to God, to omnipotence, sin, atonement, and so forth, and claims for which there is no empirical means of confirmation, such as that God is triune, or that Jesus is interceding for the saints, logical positivism's verification principle seemed to rule out the meaningfulness of what Christians said. So how can we reply to that? Well, I would reply, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. Is that homey enough for you? As it turns out, the effect of applying the verification principle of meaningfulness was really much different than what the logical positivist had envisioned or intended. The result of applying the verification criterion across the board was, in fact, more than embarrassing to the critics of religious language. You see, the logical positivist, just like the Christian, holds a particular view of the world, of man, and reality as a whole. And this outlook leads the logical positivist 
just like the Christian, to endorse and follow certain standards or rules for human behavior and reasoning. For the logical positivist, there is no supernatural reality, and man is simply one more random component of the physical world, though amazingly, almost miraculously complex. Given this outlook, men are obliged to live and speak in a certain way. This message is continued on the next tape.